what's up, everyone? Welcome to Mix in America. This is episode 13. I have with me a very special guest. I think I say that about everyone, but um, I'll actually say this guy is pretty special. He's a cool guy. Thomas Williams. He is the young adult pastor at Living Word mm -hmm. and Life Groups pastor. Yep. We're at the St. Paul campus for Living Word. Mm -hmm. uh, I've known him for a while since he was in high school. Yeah. I was actually his uh, 242 leader at the uh, youth group. And his, I don't know if I was actually your counselor ever, but I know I was for your grade. A couple of times. Okay. If I was so, in, yeah. so I knew him back when he uh, had a temper and got himself in trouble back in high school. All the time. Which I think he's a little better about now. But, <laughs> so first of all, thanks for joining me, Thomas. For sure. Um, I want you to introduce yourself. Let's get started with, everybody's has, has their own unique story, right? We talk mm -hmm. about um, how important people's stories are, their perspectives, um, the way you grew up, mm -hmm. shape the way you think now, um, what you've experienced, shapes your opinions, your your view on things. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about what it was like for you growing up. For sure. In Brooklyn Park, your mom's black, your dad's white. Yeah. Um, but you're not mixed like me. Right. You're, you always talk about you are a quarter <laughs> white. Yeah. Um, but if I look at you, black. okay, you're black. Right. Like you said, your hair mm -hmm. gives it away a little bit, right? right your hair's right. got that little, that quarter white that's in your hair. <laughs> um, but just talk about what it's like, I guess, briefly kind of what was your family life like growing up yeah um okay so like you said my dad's white um, my mom's black my biological father's mixed and so i didn't i didn't know him growing up only know his name he wasn't ever in my life but my dad who is my stepdad his name's Dwayne, was in my life my whole time my whole life and so growing up i had a younger sister she was mixed and i had two older siblings that were also they're they're lighter complexion but they're, they are mixed um, and so growing up, um, I went to uh, public, public school for most of my life. And so for me, it was this weird thing of very quickly, I wasn't black enough for the black kids, but I, was, I wasn't white enough for the white kids. I was like in this middle here. And I had to quickly find my identity in something else because I just didn't gel. I didn't have black culture, but I didn't spe specifically have white culture either. And so it was this weird thing growing up of trying to find my place, who am I, what am I about? And it was tough. It was tough for a lot of the years until I kind of like found who I was and found people who were able to accept me as for me beyond my skin color. My skin color didn't mean a lot to me growing up because I couldn't, I don't know. Yeah, it it just it just was. You didn't like identify as that. No. Yeah. It, me me being black. It. I, well, what did what did that mean? Yeah. I, it, it never it never meant anything. It was yeah. My skin's black, but that doesn't like what. How does that shape me? Because yeah, it just it was weird. Because that's that's the whole thing, right? My my dad. I thought my dad was my dad. Until I went to daycare one day. You grew, I mean, he you grew up with him, like right? He's like he, he's he held dad's me when I was yeah. born. Yeah. He held me when I was born. Like he was always there. Yeah. And so I went to daycare one day when I was younger, and he dropped me off. The woman goes, "Who is that?" I go, "That's my dad." And she goes, "No, he's not." I was like, "What do you mean?" She's like, "Well, why is his skin color different?" And that's wow. when I clicked in my mind at five six. I was like, "Well, wait." First of all, who says that to a five year old? You know, like Yes. No, that's yes, insane. Yes. And yeah. I was like, I was like, oh, okay. So I went home, asked my mom. My mom was absolutely upset. Yeah. So oh, upset that someone would say that. And oh, so goodness. but until that moment it, it hadn't clicked in my mind that he couldn't be my father. So like, you know, little kids, you don't see race. Yeah. And so that's why like skin color just didn't matter until I was told it until I was told it mattered. But yeah. that was just the whole thing. Like I well, why don't you have more black friends? Well, why do I need to have more black friends? Well, what is, what's wrong with having white friends? It was just, people were people, they were my friends. It wasn't about skin color. When, when did you, was it high school? When did you start to kind of, like you said, you didn't really think about race until you were told you had to kind of thing. Mm, yeah. Which is, I think my experience too, for the most part. When was that, that you started kind of being I guess, quote unquote, r racially aware or like, when I mean, did you really think about, okay, I'm black, I'm different than my white friends? Yeah. I mean, so I also played hockey my whole life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so my older brother, Andrew, I grew up watching him play hockey and every little brother wants to be like their older brother. So if my brother's playing hockey, I want to play hockey. Yeah. That's why I started playing hockey. And so, I mean, 
very quickly when people would ask me, oh, you know, what sports do you play growing up? Oh, I play hockey. What do you mean? Black people don't play <laughs> hockey. It's like, what does that mean? I, I'm black and I play hockey. And so I've, I've always been somewhat aware, but when I had to come to grips with that, with that type of like statements every day, all day, I would say that was really in high school. So you went you went to Park Center. Yep, public school. You're from you're from Brooklyn Park. Born and raised. But it's a, I'll say the nicer it was a nicer part of Brooklyn Park. You're not far from the golf course. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of my thing. <laughs> yeah, my thing. Brooklyn Park. You have to specify. There's now you have to. Like, it's north of six ten, is nice. Yes, north of six ten is nice. And I, the golf course area is, as there's a certain distance from the golf course that will mm-hmm. always be nice sure. to a certain extent because sure. you're like right by the golf course. Sure. I dated a girl in high school that lived on the golf course in Brooklyn Park. Those are nice houses. And she was in Brooklyn Park, but that was a ni- like way nicer than where I lived in Champlain. Like right, it was right. it was nice. So you were you were we were like you were middle on the class. We were like middle were, class. But you were fairly close to the golf course. Fairly. But you went to Living Word, mm-hmm. which is predominantly a pretty white, white church. Mm-hmm. I mean it's better than probably it was even back in my, when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. But what was so? What was your kind of journey, at racial church. journey scene like? Okay, at at Park Center is a much more diverse group yeah. of people yeah. than your friends at Living Word. Yeah. So like, what was what was good about Living Word though was because I had grown up there basically my whole life. People I felt like accepted me for me, and yeah. like this. What's, what's good about like Jesus is that the spiritual side of things kind of levels the playing field. Okay. Whether you're black, white, Asian, brown, whatever, when you're delivering the word of God or when you're like in worship together, that doesn't matter. And I think because I had been there for so long, I wasn't necessarily skiing for my skin color. I was more skiing for just who I was, but also the craziness that I would do. Yeah. I, I was more than my skin color at church. Which was nice. And the interesting thing with with you, what well, you talked about here was like the the idea of not being black enough. Yeah. Which obviously is something that I've talked about that's been a challenge for me because I I don't even, I mean I don't even look black for the most part. My skin is not that dark. <laughs> sure. um, You're mixed and actually, up. no, I always say this too: is black people can usually tell that I have black in me because mm-hmm. I have black features, yep. like my nose or my lips. Um, white people usually just think I'm white or wonder what I am because they really only see skin color. Sure. <laughs> they don't really understand black features. So they're sure. like, oh, no, like I have plenty of white friends who are darker than I am. Yeah. Like they just are. I'm not that dark, especially in the, in the Minnesota winters. But for you, I would say most white people probably look at you and say, oh, he's black. Yep. But there's something about the black culture in America, and I, I say America because I don't know what it's like in the rest of the world, because I grew up in America. But where you, there's like a blackness that needs to like, there's a levels of blackness, or there's mm-hmm. like, I use the example of Will Smith and Carlton, right, Fresh Prince. Mm-hmm. Um, Carlton is not seen as black enough, right? Right, like that's his whole struggle throughout right. the show, not seen as black enough. Yep. Even though obviously his skin's plenty dark, it's, it's not about skin color. Nope. Is that what you're talking about when you're talking about blackness, especially I would probably say at yes. Park Center, yes. where there are there is more diversity versus at Living Word, yes. where there was what the three of you that grew up together at Living Word that were black, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the blackness of you have to represent this stereotype in the culture that I'm quote unquote used to. That's the narrative that has been one of the most frustrating things of my life. People tell me, oh, you know, you're like an Oreo. You're black on the outside, white that. on the inside. Oh, you know, you don't, you talk, you talk white. You sound white when you talk. And I used to question those things so much. I'd be like, what does that mean? When you say that I talk white, are you saying that I don't talk like I'm from the hood? Like I should be talking a certain way? I don't like, I would confront it because it, it, would, it would hurt. It's like, what does that mean to talk white? Is it because I'm educated? Because I was in I was in some of the higher um, programs in high school for like reading and English, yeah. and so I had a very diverse vocabulary, and people would say, "Oh, this is it, it." Just was annoying. Yeah, it still is. It still is, and I still confront people on I don't know, I won't say a regular basis, but every now and then I have to confront someone. Like you actually call people out on that? Yeah, when they when they say you talk white, so what does yeah. that mean? What do they say? Well, you well, you, you know what I mean. Like you, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like no, yeah, yeah. I don't know. No, explain you, it. You tell explain me. Explain it. Yeah. Did you ever find yourself like questioning or like, or is it just, it was other people's problems and you handled that pretty well? Yeah, because I am what I am 
and I can't change it. Yeah. And it was obvious that my skin color wasn't giving people, um, I wasn't living up to what my skin color said, but I couldn't flip it and be like, okay, well, I'm just going to be white now because I didn't want to be that either. I wanted to be me. And so that's why with my spirituality, I feel like if I wasn't going to church, then I don't know who I would have been. Yeah. Because in people's minds, as they're seeing me and I'm not conforming to the stereotype, like I'm also a really good swimmer. I know how to swim very well. <laughs> so in gym I class, when we had the swimming unit, literally all the black kids are in the shallow end because they don't know how to swim. And I'm the only black kid in the deep end because I know how to swim. My life yeah. has always been about going against the grain, against the stereotype. And that just is what it is. And so I think all those things that you said earlier contribute to the not being black enough just because I'm not like your normal, typical what you see on the news, black person. But I feel like the news only highlights on maybe like inner city, urban, black culture. Yeah. There's a whole nother thing of like what it means to grow up in the suburbs. Yeah. That's a whole different thing. And so, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I always hated, which is, it became, I don't know if they even use it anymore, but I remember like when I was in high school and maybe college a little beyond, the term like to be less offensive instead of saying black, they'd say like urban. Like I remember <laughs> my sister bought me a birthday card from Target one time uh, from the urban section. So I thought, I don't think, and I remember working at, I worked at Best Buy right out of college yeah. and they had, they, they tried like an urban movie section. Yeah. And it was basically like all the black movies. Sure. And I'm like, urban. urban's not interchangeable with black. Like you said, yeah. to, to um, reduce someone's like racial identity to, to being urban and like right. oh if you're black you're from the streets and you listen to rap music yeah. and you probably do drugs and you mm -hmm. you know you can't speak proper english because mm -hmm. you use you use ebonics did you deal with that at park center at all did you and park center even and i don't know what racial tensions it might have been like or like social economic but park center has a, a wide diversity of, mm -hmm. of like i said if they grew up on the golf course yeah they grew up in a different neighborhood sure. than, than three blocks down the road sure park center had had a diversity not not just blacks white asian mm -hmm. um social economic diversity mm -hmm. um you know christians and not and everything in between like predominantly what park center i mean sure you have different socioeconomics but it was i mean you go to the lunchroom and see where people eat yeah. There's the white section, the black section, the Asian section. Were they pretty like, segregated? The, then? Yeah, no, for sure. Like, yeah. it's, it's legit, legitimately segregated. And you'll have, like, a couple, like, outliers of people who will, like, intermix, if you will. But predominantly, it's segre segregated by race. Like, and th that, that was always a whole thing, like, in my grade of, like, oh, like, you know, some girls, they, they want to be with the black guys because of blah, 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 blah. And, like, the white guys feeling like they can't compete. And just, like, this weird thing of, like, if a, a girl's dating outside the race, then like she's like less than or this, this, and that, the other. Like it's my, she, she's mine because we're white. It was just this weird, like a weird thing. Yeah. A weird thing. That's all. <laughs> um, I do want to talk about one specific high school experience. You mentioned this. Um, this was, well, it was right after George Floyd and yeah. uh, Pastor Jamie gave you and Ryan and then um, your keyboard player, Daryl is his name. Yep. He, he gave you guys space to to just basically share your experience, which yeah. I thought was really cool. Um, a lot of white pastors across America were scrambling to what do I do that first weekend after George Floyd, right? That first right. Sunday, right? Like right. there was a lot of people, including here at Living Word, people struggling with what to do. Mm -hmm. I thought what Jamie did was was good and and I thought it was powerful and I thought it was personable and it was real right. like it wasn't a lot of pastors were like literally scrambling to like i need to find a black person to put mm -hmm. on stage right mm -hmm. and jamie gave space to you guys not just because oh i could find a black person right these are two close friends yep. who he's known forever yep. who are on high positions in staff yep. at living word saint paul and he gave you space to talk right um so if you want to talk about that a little bit but specifically yep. i want to ask you about one of the stories you told me that still makes me mad, and I, I, I believe you, yeah. but I, I can't believe it. Like wrap my head around. Yeah. You said you were playing hockey. Yep. In high school, your senior year, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, and you said the student start section of the other team started chanting the N word at you. Yeah. And nobody did anything. Yeah. Can you talk about that and like, yeah. what was that experience like? 
Yeah, so like because people said, don't, that was 2012. Like yeah. people think of racism as so long ago, but like mm -hmm. this is a real example of, you know, maybe not blatant, you know, getting shot because you're black, but like this is the kind of stuff that you grow up with in right. the Twin Cities, right? Not right. that long ago. Yeah, yeah. So like you said, 2012. Um, I'm on the ice, and I'm right next to the opposing fan section, and all of a sudden I seen them like, you know, moving their hands, like they're chopping at me. And I was like, oh, maybe they're saying whatever. But then I'm listening and I hear just, and word, and word. And I was like, wow, like, really? And so then I turned my back to act like, you know, I just couldn't hear anything. Um, but I remember thinking like, wow, these kids are really gonna be chanting, like a whole section. So yeah, 50, 70, whatever kids saying this. But there's parents there, there's a fit, there's administrators there, and no one's doing anything. That that was the craziest part where it's like, I can't be the only one who, I can't be the only one who's hearing this. Let alone I know one person had this idea, but now you have a whole group of people who are following along and saying this. Was it legit like the whole student section or like a yeah, no, guys? No, or? yes, no, yes, the whole the whole section. And and right now what I remember in my mind, but yes, the whole section, just like N word, N word, and, and and hockey is a very like, it's a brutal sport. I mean, between chirps and making fun of people and stuff like that, and racism isn't anything new, um, in that world, <laughs> nothing new. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, that's 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 one instance. Like another one I talk about when I was younger was just because I was a black kid that grew up in a predominantly white environment, racist jokes were always the best to tell to me, which is always so <laughs> annoying. And the one joke that still that still sticks with me is, what's the difference between a black man and a park bench? A park bench can support a family of four. Jeez. And that and you're getting told this like eight years old, nine years old, ten years old, and it's like, don't you want to hear that one? Or like in hockey, when you shoot at a corner, it's like, oh, I picked that corner. It's like, oh yeah, he picks that corner like he picks cotton. Just stuff Dang. like that. It's just. Wasn't well, that funny, Thomas? And it's like, no, it's not. So these are white people saying these jokes to you. Yes. Like, why do they think that? Because it should be funny to me. But they're, but not from them. I, that's a, that's the thing that I don't think I don't think white people get. Like, you know how many white people that are not racist, right? Quote, they they say they're not racist, but like argue about the N word and will say like. If you can say it, then I can say it. Right. Like, have you heard white people say that? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. but I'm like, why? First of all, why do you want to say it? You shouldn't <laughs> want to say it. Right? There's no reason a white person should want to say it. Um, but, but then, like, like those jokes, like, why? I don't get why they would think that's funny. Like, why would they? Or why would they think that you think it's like? Why would they want to tell that joke? Like, yeah. if another black guy wants to say that to you, mm -hmm. and like, then I maybe whatever. But I, I don't yeah. understand why white people would even try to think that's funny or say that's funny or try to like make you laugh by doing that stuff. Um, but one of the things when you talked about that, that story, it was that nobody did anything. Yeah. That story of playing hockey. Yep. Um, how that's one of the, con that's a big part of the convert race conversation right now, I think in 2020 and really the last probably five, six years mm -hmm. in America um, is this idea of like white advocacy yeah. maybe is the word I'll use, but like, and it doesn't even, I don't, I don't think it has to be just white people, but like that idea of just being supported, of yeah. feeling, you know, Jamie made space for you to be heard yeah. kind of thing. I think that's where a lot of the frustrations, that's where a lot of the, not just the protest, but the rioting and the stuff that gets out of hand is just like, they don't feel heard. Right. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Is that something yeah. where, whether it's you personally or like conversations you've had with other people that are like, we just feel like we're not being heard. Like, right. White, a lot of white people in the suburbs are asking now, what can I do? Right. Like one thing I say is, is listen, mm -hmm. have a conversation and actually listen to these people yeah. every once in a while. Yeah, I think that one, just for me, it's been the story of my life that whenever someone was saying something racist to me, that the people around me didn't do anything or they knew about what someone had said and again, didn't do anything. It, it's just this repeat thing of like, oh, we want to help, but I'm like, you know the people around you who say these things, who make these jokes, but usually it's like, well, you know, they're not racist. They're just trying to be funny. Yeah. But it's like, no, but they're being racist and yeah. they're not funny. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's like, 
like I, another example would be playing video games online. I know if you're in 2012 era, Xbox Live, <laughs> Call of Duty, Halo. The, 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 the go-to insult on there is the N-word. And again, really? Oh, yeah, for wow. sure. Stupid, I've never been an online game. No, no, stupid N-word, this, this, that, whatever. Just They, they don't even know you. Yeah. They just say it. Do they know you're black? No, they, they can't. Oh, they can't, but they yeah. just say okay. it because that's the insult. And again, when wow. you're a girl around predominantly white people, it's like we all know people say this, but no one's saying, hey, we're not going to say this. Yeah. No one's saying, hey, we're, we're not going to tolerate this. It's just kind of like people are trying to be funny because it's not personal. It's just a funny joke. That's not a funny that's, joke. That, that's that's what it always is. It's wow. not personal. I didn't, I didn't know that was it's just a funny joke. Like you ask anyone who grew up in that era of like the 2012, 2010, like online world of Call of Duty, those chats, man. Like that's yeah. interesting because again, a random thing that I probably have to edit out, but um, I don't know if you heard about the NASCAR driver Kyle Larson uh, a few months ago got. He lost his ride because he said the N word. They were doing oh, online yeah. driving, and yep. he said the N word, mm -hmm. and he lost his sponsor. And ended up losing his ride. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure he'll get a ride again soon. But my thing was like, why did he even use that word? Oh yeah. Like I don't think he's racist. Which is, the irony is he's actually a graduate of the Drive for Diversity program that NASCAR does because sure. he's half Asian. Sure. So he like he was he's by far the most successful. Yeah. Um, I guess maybe Bubba Wallace might end up being that, but up to this point it's been kyle larson yeah so he's like nascar is so proud of this drive for diversity program to like give minorities a place to and the support they need to drive and he ends up being the one that so that so i don't know if he's racist or not but i i'm like why would he even no. say that word but maybe that's, if that's a thing online that's a, that's a thing like, online blows my mind like yeah. that's that's not okay at all holy no. crap like even today when um, i'm like playing video games i've, I've had a guy he was like yeah, you know, I hope you're black. I hope you're N-word, N-word, N-word. I hope you're just like, just because I, I didn't do something that he liked in the game. This is like 20, 20, 20. I hope you're an N-word. And it's just like, you're doing what? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Dang, that, yes. that kind of blows my mind. I mean, it absolutely blows my mind. Be, because there's no accountability. I'm never going to meet him. I mean, the, the internet's he's, the worst place in the world. He's, he's in his own little vacuum. He's yeah. frustrated. He can say the worst things he wants to say. There, cause, again, because there's no accountability. Yeah. And so that's the thing now that racism is now, it's not more prevalent. It's just getting more exposed. Yeah, for sure. Um, But yeah. Okay, one thing I did want to talk to you about, um, we won't go much longer here, but one conversation that we've had, and I think we've had it since you were in high school, but the term African-American. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I don't know if you have come to your conclusions because of what I've said, but um, I remember talking to you about this back when you were in high school, but about mm -hmm. the term African-American. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about that term? Because that's like uh, the politically correct way, yeah, right? I, like that's... Yeah, I can't stand the, polit the politically correct way. For me, African-American is someone who was born in Africa and that comes to America. They are African-American. Me, I am black. I am yeah. born in the USA, black. Don't know what my quote-unquote cultural heritage is other than slavery yeah. and oppression but i'm black in the same way a white person is white even though way back when their ancestors originated in europe or whatever they're not called european american yeah. they're called white they can try and say that they're polish or swedish norwegian but if they were to try and go to those countries those people would tell them no you're white yeah same thing with me trying to go to africa if i try to go to sudan or niger I'd be like no you're American, you're black. Like it's it's different. Yeah. In my opinion. Obviously I agree with you. That's why I asked the question, because I know I know you feel that way because we've had these conversations before. Cause like my I've never been to Africa. Mm -hmm. My mom's never been to Africa. Her mom's never been to Africa. Her mom's never been to Africa. Um we're way more than a few generations off the boat. Like I think I've told you this before. I've been to the plantation where my ancestors were slaves. Wow. Like we've, I know, I know for sure I've been a slave. I don't know where wow. my ancestors came from in Africa. Yeah. But I know that my ancestors a few generations back served on a plantation in Missouri because wow. I've been there. Um, it's not, it doesn't exist anymore. It got wiped, destroyed in a flood in 93, but I've been there. We used wow. to have family meetings there. I remember running in the fields as a kid. Wow. Um, so to, to qualify my blackness or my as African American, I'm not, I don't identify with African culture. Right. I, I don't know what country in Africa my ancestors were from. Right. Um, if you if you have to qualify me by black, then sure, say black. Sure. Um, personally, I think part of the reason that white people 
say African American is I don't think black offends black people. Right. I think white people have a hard time saying that word. Yeah. Black. It sounds weird <laughs> to them. And I if somebody it was after George Floyd and there's been a lot more race conversations over the last few months. But somebody was saying it was a black person that was saying, No, white people, you need to say black. You need, like with that K, like black. <laughs> like say it. Like you don't get off because I don't I still think one of the funniest thing in the world is when white people say like black African Americans <laughs> when they say black African because they don't know because they're like, oh wait, I shouldn't say black. And it's like, just say black. Like yeah. I don't know why nobody should be offended by black. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, some people might, I don't know. Right. Um, but like you said, I don't qualify me as a as a type of American. I'm just as American. If not personally, I know I'm more American than most white people I know because sure. most white people have come here, their ancestors have come here over the last few generations right. where I know, and then on my dad's side, he's Native American. Mm. So I know his ancestors have been here for a while <laughs> too, right? So so I, I'm, I'm about as American as you can get. Sure. So just call me American or if you want to say black or uh, being mixed is a whole other thing because what do you call that? When, right. I was, when I was growing up, it probably just started becoming offensive to say mulatto. Sure. But that's that's what they were using like in the 80s, mm -hmm. which is super racist. <laughs> um, by the way, don't ever say mulatto if you're listening to this. Um, it literally comes from the, I think the Spanish word for mule. So <laughs> don't, don't use that word. Um, so one of the other things you just mentioned, and this will probably be my last question unless we have more to talk about, but you talked about in high school, the, the white girls liking black guys mm -hmm. and like thinking they're cool. Um, this is a new, a fairly new trend. I, I grew up, I, I couldn't tell you any other interracial couples, mixed kids other than my family, like mm -hmm. my cousins and my, mm -hmm. si my siblings. Um, but now it's pretty common, mm -hmm. which I think is great. Mm -hmm. As a product of an interracial marriage myself, right. I think it's awesome. Um, but you married a white woman. Mm -hmm. uh, your good friend Ryan Watkins yep. married a white woman. Yep. Uh, Savan was engaged to a white woman. Yep. Um, Kanisha married a white guy. Yep. There's a lot of it in our church. In fact, I think I don't know. I can't think of any black people that married other black people in this church <laughs> <laughs> right now. Um, just just kind of real quick. Maybe that's a lot to just throw at you. But like, what are your thoughts on? Obviously, I'm assuming you're happy with the decision you made mm -hmm. to marry Brianna. But mm -hmm. like. That idea of like, there's almost a, a wave of, and there's about to be a whole bunch of mixed babies, mm -hmm. especially specifically at Living Word. But yes. I mean, in America in general, yeah. there's about to be a whole lot of mixed babies. Um, do you have a, a thought on that? Yeah. In general, I know there, there's like a group of people that would try and say, "Well, you've just been whitewashed to praise white people, and now you want white women." Like, blah 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 blah. But I'm like, I absolutely like my mom. I love my mom through and through. She is black. She is beautiful. I absolutely love her. And I've dated a black girl. Um, her name is Tolu, and she was absolutely beautiful too. Um, I remember her. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't think who you date has to mean this like, you worship white culture, or if a white girl dates a black guy, you worship black culture. Like, I think that gets a little too boxed. Like yeah. I see the humanity in the woman that I'm with and that's what I fell in love with. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, she's white, so blah, 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 no. It is her heart, who she is. And same thing with Ryan. Ryan grew up in the inner city. His yeah. older brother died because he got shot. Like Ryan is the, he's what black. do you call it? With like the hard K, the Yo, black. he's black. Like, like yeah. the stereotype, like Urban he, culture, he is yeah. that. And like, you you fall in love with with what your heart wants. It's it's yeah. it's deeper than skin color. Because his wife absolutely beautiful inside and out, but is in tune too also with what you would quote unquote call black culture. But like, it's more. It's she's more from than a small that. town in Minnesota, so she's it, not she's not like hood like urban. But yeah, no, she's just a beautiful person. Yeah, and that's what he fell in love with. So. Why stuff like this is happening? I don't know. I think just people are taking the limits off things, especially to my, my parents, right? Both black and white. Yeah. Like, but before my dad married my mom, he was married to another black woman. Like, yeah. And this this is like what in the in the in the eighties nineties? I don't know. It's just 
They're people, man. They're people. Yeah, that was one of the first one honestly, like quite a few people when I in college, I would when I met new people and they found out I was mixed, guys would be like, Oh, what kind of girls do you like? Do you like black girls or white girls? I was like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I like girls. Like, <laughs> well, I, I yes, don't know. No, yes. If she's pretty and we talk and I like her, then, you know, yeah. I married a white woman. She happened to be white. If Jocelyn was black, I still would have married her. She was Asian or Hispanic it, or whatever. Exactly. It wouldn't have made a difference. No, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, but yeah, some people see that and they, like, you didn't set out to, I'm going to marry, like you said, you you loved your mom. And if you married a black woman like her, then go for, go for it. No, but, right, right. But you didn't. All right, I do have one last question. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is my final one, I promise. But you are, I talked about in the beginning, a uh, young adult pastor at Living Word, mm-hmm. your life group's pastor mm-hmm. over at the St. Paul campus here at Living Word. Um, what do you see as your, um, and maybe this is a heavy question, but what do you see as your role? What have you done or want to do uh, in the last few months since George Floyd specifically, because that's what that's yeah. when that's when racism really hit the Twin Cities, right? Yeah. Like yeah. that's when we found out that oh, racism can live in the cold. Like yeah. it can be this far north. Yeah. W- what have you done? What have you wanted to do? Or what would you, um, whether it's using your platform or I know you've been down to Minneapolis. I saw you, you know, leading some some protests and stuff. Yeah. Um, so what have you done? What do you hope to do? Or what is something that you would tell people to do? Like Okay, how can we help? What yeah. can we do now? Um, whether they're white or black or whatever, right? Where, where do you go? Where do we go from here? Where do you personally go from here? Personally, what I jumped to immediately was awareness. Um, the George Floyd incident for me, the George Floyd murder. Excuse me. I saw myself in George Floyd because as much as I try and like make myself who I am, respectable, and this isn't the other. When a person sees me, the first thing they're gonna see is my skin color and they're gonna treat me in such a way, yeah. regardless of who I am. And so I could end up dead. And that shook me. So I began to protest. But then with talking to people, right, because the media politicizes everything, it gets muddy. Yeah. But you have to break it down to people and acknowledge, do you think there is a problem? Not even, let's say, forget about just racism. At a human level, What we are doing to each other, is it okay? Can we agree on that? And if we can't agree on that, then there's not not even a conversation. Cool, there's a problem at the human level, okay? Now let's go to the next level. What do we wanna do about that problem with the injustices that are happening? For me, I I try and anchor on things that we can agree upon versus things that can become, again, political. Because the Black Lives Matter movement, BLM movement, I straight up don't agree with everything they say or do. Yeah. But yet they're, ter- they're they're labeled Black Lives Matter, and I agree that Black Lives Matter. Yeah. I myself matter. You, Josh, matter. Ryan matters. But the way they do everything, I don't agree with. And a lot of white people are there. So it's like, forget about what we disagree on. Can we agree that police reform needs to happen? Yeah. Can Can we agree that in the supermarket, when you see a store manager following someone around because they're black, that shouldn't happen? Yeah. That we need to say something. It's just, so it's like, regardless of the political agendas, who are the individual people you know in your community and how can they feel more supported? Because I guarantee it, at some level, they've experienced some form of racism or what they deem as discrimination and they did not feel like they had anybody there to support them. Yeah. So who do you know in your immediate sphere that you can be an advocate for? That's what That was like my biggest thing with church people is that forget about the political agenda. Where do you see Jesus Christ? Yeah. Is he is he the one casting stones or is he in the dirt with the hurt, with the broken people, yeah. with the victims? Where is Jesus? And let that determine yeah. your life. No, I saw, um, there's this guy on, on Instagram that Jocelyn follows that's black. Um, and he was saying in, in response to a lot of, it's a lot of the church, to be honest with you, that's their response to Black Lives Matter is all lives matter or yeah. they'll 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 find the quote from whatever it's i owens. think candace owens is yes. the big one um, even like um denzel washington or morgan freeman i think have quotes out there not to the extent of candace owens mm-hmm. i'm not putting them in that conversation mm-hmm. but but they they find the few black people that agree with them is what right. i was saying so they right. find the, the the black people that agree with them and they say see look at this and then right. they, but but he what he was saying is don't try to find a black person that agrees with you Find the black people in your life and hear what they say. Right. Because that's what makes a difference. Right. Like one of the things that Jocelyn was saying in all of this was 
this is this is South Minneapolis. This is like you said, Ryan Watkins grew up right there. Mm-hmm. Like that could have been Ryan Watkins. Yes. Right. Not forget forget whatever you want about George Floyd's past, whatever he mm-hmm. may have done at the time, whatever. Right there on that street corner, a cop could have, could have arrested Ryan Watkins and done the same thing. Right. Right. Um, so make it personal, and that's the thing: is listen to people mm-hmm. and support people that are in your life. Don't mm-hmm. don't uh, find a a black person that you agree with and retweet them. Find the black person in your life and how can you support them? Mm-hmm. And not not making it political. Like I love what you said about Black Lives Matter. It's like you don't support the organization necessarily, everything they stand for, right? Mm-hmm. If you go to their website and look at what they believe, right. I, don't, I don't agree with a lot of what they say. Right. But those three words in that order, yes. Black Lives Matters, yes. is true. Right. That, that sentence is not political. Mm-mm. That should not be debated. Yeah. Um, yes, I agree. All lives matter, but that mm-hmm. does, but but it, you shouldn't be offended by Black Lives Matter because it doesn't say White Lives don't matter. Yeah, they never said nobody else didn't matter. No, and and whether you want to get mad at the organization for their marketing to call their organization Black Lives Matters, and now you can talk about all that, whatever. Right. But, right. Beside the issue. But that yeah, that's a separate issue. Yeah. You you absolutely should have no problem saying the words Black Lives Matter. Right. Because they do. Right. Is there anything else you wanted to say? We talked, covered a lot of stuff, talked about a lot, yeah. but obviously we could um, go on this for hours. And I know me and you could have a conversation right. for a while too if we go into Tom Brady or something mm-hmm. like that. But just keep focused on this. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to say? I just want to echo that last point you made. Um, for me, like with the Candace Owens or like there's like the Hodge twins and stuff like that, what their own story and perspective is, it can't be the narrative for all people. Yeah. Like my experience, I only speak to my experience as a black individual who grew up in the suburbs. I cannot attest to or talk about what inner city life is like because I yeah. have not been there. Yeah. So to you to take those couple people's opinions and say, this is what it is, it doesn't go. Not to mention taking quotes from, between Morgan Freeman, Travis Scott, and bring these questions outside of context. Yeah. Because they did interviews five years ago yeah. when things were vastly different. You have to have the people in your life ask them a question and listen. Like for me, here's a big one, right? I can't say that I've experienced systemic racism. Yeah. But I can say that I've experienced regular racism all the time yeah and is it a hard stretch of the imagination for me to say the same people like at the xl energy center right people who buy hockey tickets and go and see those games can look it up the black men who are in the nhl experience racism all the time all the time and so those same guys that are buying tickets to go to those hockey games and are saying those nasty words is it that hard to believe that those guys also occupy positions of power at their jobs oh, yeah. and based upon who they want to hire or fire that they're seeing this individual as the N-word? Yeah. That's not that big of a stretch for me. But I can't prove that. Yeah. So I just say it, I think it's possible. I can't prove it. But I do know racism is, is very real. I don't know about systemic because I've never experienced it. But I can see it. Yeah, And so it's just being real. Forget about the agendas. We're talking about real people's lives, real people's experiences. And if you're saying that you've never experienced racism as a white individual, I guarantee it. Go find a black person. I'll bet you'll tell you they have. It's yeah. real. But it's just based upon your proximity to people and what those experiences are that will enlarge and enrich who you are as a person. That's good. That's, that's really good. I'm going to end there. Cool. Because I think that was great. So thank you, Thomas, for joining me. Sitting thank down for you. this conversation. Thank you guys for listening. And join me next Monday for episode 14 of Mix in America. Hey, thanks for watching my video. I hope you liked it. If you did, can you do three things for me? Can you like the video, subscribe to my channel, and tell your friends.